name is Alison Evans. I'm the president and CEO of Research Canada, which is an alliance of organizations from across the health research and innovation ecosystem. Our members range from hospital research institutes to pharmaceutical companies, from med tech startups to post-secondary institutions, from provincial health organizations to health charities. Despite differences across these organizations, we share the vision that a world-leading health research and innovation system is essential to the health and prosperity of Canadians and the country. One of the most important things I observed through several town halls, focus groups, board conversations, stakeholder and member engagements in the lead up to Budget 2024, in the months that have followed, and in service of the capstone organization consultations earlier this summer, is this. There's growing consensus from health and broader research and innovation stakeholders that the severity of our declining prosperity, competitiveness and innovation must be addressed in new ways and without delay. So much so that previously siloed sectors and organizations are lining up to work together in ways I've not seen before. Incredible things are happening in businesses, in labs, in clinical trials, in regional innovation hubs. But for those pockets of success and ingenuity to lead to transformative outcomes across the country, national leadership in the form of compelling vision, decreased regulatory and other hurdles, and the provision and coordination of much-needed resources is essential. Now is the time to be bold. We need renewed ambition for research and innovation as a driver of not just health outcomes, but economic outcomes that matter. And in so doing, alleviate the alarming and growing frustration of Canadians as they grapple with the many repercussions of declining productivity, quality of life and health. Canada has not adequately translated its investments in research and building a highly educated workforce into domestic innovation. Why is it that we don't have a homegrown global biopharmaceutical success story, much like RIM? The top three biotechs on the NASDAQ, Amgen, Vertex, and Gilead have a market capitalization of over 400 billion US dollars, which eclipses the market cap of all 129 oil and gas companies. Or take Novo Nordisk, their market cap has at times exceeded the entire GDP of Denmark. The irony is that company was founded on insulin, a Canadian innovation that they licensed for $1. Thus, Research Canada welcomed Budget 2024's investments and measures that respond to key findings in the report of the Advisory Panel on the Federal Research Support System that suggests readiness to modernize and strengthen Canada's research and innovation system. The promise of the capstone organization is greater coordination and impact of research supported by NSERC, SHRC and CIHR, as well as the advancement of Canada's leadership in internationally collaborative, major multidisciplinary and mission-driven research. The capstone organization, if effectively implemented and refined with input ongoing from stakeholders, could do even more. It could be used to strengthen the linkages between basic research, clinical research, and the commercialization of research for better health and economic outcomes in ways we've not been able to achieve. In our submission to the tri-agency presidents earlier this summer, we suggested a number of principles to be upheld in the pursuit of this capstone organization, and I'm happy to elaborate on them in the Q&A period, particularly those that pertain to CIHR and the health portfolio. We also identified risks, including funding, the connection of health research to the health of Canadians, and the system of healthcare delivery. And we saw those reflected in the What We Heard report, and we're glad to see them there. We also note the critical importance of marrying structure with strategy, which is to say that structural changes in the absence of strategy and prioritization could jeopardize the intent of transformative change. Tinkering at the margins of our research and innovation ecosystem, adjusting structures, programs and policies is no longer sufficient. What we need is leadership and overarching vision, which is why we've also been actively feeding into the work being done to stand up a council on science and innovation. 
We understand that this is a challenging moment and that competition for mind share and resources is at an all-time high. Other countries see research and innovation as the way forward. We believe Canada has an opportunity to lift itself out of this record slump in, in productivity by maximizing previous investments in infrastructure, in grants, in programs, in organizations for all types of research and innovation. And that's, that's quite a bit over our time. Okay, so I'm sorry. We probably have a chance to elaborate on Thank some you. of the comments. Thank you in for our that. Questions. Thank you. So now, uh, Ms. Lafambrose, you have the floor for an opening statement of five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and the members of the Standing Committee for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Sarah Lafambrose, and I'm joining as the Executive Director at Evidence for Democracy, known as E4D for short. E4D is a national, nonpartisan, not for profit that works to close the gap between decision makers like you and the best available science and evidence. We believe that we all benefit when government makes, makes decisions that are informed by the best available science and evidence. Canada is facing significant challenges, low productivity, climate change, and a strained healthcare system, all requiring evidence-informed policies. While Canada ranks sixth in the higher education, research, and development expenditure amongst OECD countries, our overall research and innovation ecosystem lacks coordination, and we risk falling behind without a strategic direction. As proposed in the 2024 federal budget, the research capstone organization promises to prove better coordination across the federally funded research ecosystem. We echo the recommendations previously made in the 2024 report of the advisory panel of the federal research support systems and the 2017 fundamental science review. I believe that ex if executed with transparency, accountability, and with community engagement, this new capstone organization could strengthen the very foundation of our science and research ecosystem. Importantly, this organization has the opportunity to lay a foundation for the development of a national strategic vision for the science and research community. I'd like to share with the committee a set of values that E4D believes to be crucial when taking on the creation of this organization. First, we believe that prioritizing transparency, accountability, and openness will ensure the utmost trust and seamless execution of this organization. For example, the Capstone organization should be sustainably funded, ensuring that we strengthen the foundations of our research ecosystem. Securing the transparent allocation of predictable funding to support the organization's operations, staff, and resources will enable long-term success. There should be an established mechanism to prevent duplication of efforts and enable open communication among research entities, promoting efficiency and collaboration. There should also be reporting, feedback, and collaboration processes with ISED and health ministers that is formalized and structured for ongoing communication and coordination with relevant government departments. There should be a publicly available strategic plan and evaluations published in annual reports to align the outcomes and impacts for this new capstone organization. Next is ensuring that the community continues to be involved in the vision and execution of the work of the capstone. At its core, the new capstone organization should ensure its work is informed by a representative set of science and technology stakeholders by intentionally establishing government bodies. While a board of directors will likely be comprised of representatives from tri-agencies, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, and the Chief Science Advisor's Office, we see an opportunity for intentional representation amongst the Science and Innovation Council. By ensuring that this council has a clearly defined mandate, the council can play a large role in providing strategic input to guide priorities and works of the capstone. Further, this council should have diverse representation from academia with dedicated representation of trainees, early career researchers, and established investigators, in addition to industry, nonpartisan, or nonprofit, and third party organizations and the public sector. Individuals should reflect Canada's diversity and regions with consideration towards gender, career stage, and marginalized communities. Beyond this, evaluation of research proposals under the capstone should uphold the values of peer review, ensuring all research proposals are evaluated based on scientific ev excellence and potential impact. It should also exist independently, and government structures should be established to protect the organization from political interference, ensuring that decision-making processes are based on scientific merit and integrity. I look forward to hearing more on the capstone in the upcoming fall economic statement, and we are encouraged by the release of the What We Heard report based on the public consultations just last week. I hope that we can continue these conversations through the coming year as more becomes clear about the structures of the capstone organization, and it's my hope that we can continue to move forward in a way that encourages active participation of researchers and community members. In summary, I will reiterate that if executed with transparency, accountability, and community engagement, 
the new capstone organization could strengthen the very foundations of our research and science ecosystem and help Can Canada unlock the full potential of its ever-growing knowledge asset and talent capacity for the benefit of society at large. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to questions. Thank you, Ms. Lavarnbois. Appreciate that. And now we will turn it over to Mr. Harari for a five-minute opening statement. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente, Honorable Vice-Présidente. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, Honorable Members. Est-ce que vous pouvez m'entendre? Can you hear me? You're being heard, sir. Go ahead. Thank you all, and thank you very much for this opportunity to address you today. Je m'excuse, mais j'entends la traduction plutôt que le texte. You may have to change channels. <laughs> Donc, je m'appelle Science Policy Center, CSPC, an independent, non-profit, non-partisan, and non-advocate organization dedicated to connecting science, innovation, and policy communities across Canada. CSPC serves as a national hub for convening, connecting, and capacity building within the science, technology, and innovation policy ecosystem. We raise our own funds through programs, including the annual conference, which is Canada's largest science and innovation policy forum. Other key programs include science policy magazines and editorials, more than 20 events annually, workshops, and Science Meets Parliament, which is a unique program bringing young scientists from across the country to meet with parliamentarians on a non-advocacy basis and learn about policy making in Canadian Parliament. Many of these programs rely on contributions from volunteers. Please note that my observations today are my personal views and do not reflect CSPC's position as CSPC does not hold any views or recommendations as it remains a neutral platform for national conversation on these matters. My perspectives as an individual comes from outside government or granting agencies or academia but is grounded in my experience working in science policy. The proposed capstone organization is based on the premise of the importance to Canada of generating more coordinated efforts, in particular in three areas, international collaborations, multidisciplinary research, and mission-driven research. I believe the context for the proposed capstone organization stems from the recognition of the rapidly changing landscape of research and the world, including geopolitical shift, and the evolving nature of scientific research as it becomes increasingly multidisciplinary, and the need for strong mission-driven research to address our socioeconomic challenges. The mandate also referenced to the gap between research outcomes and their application in public policy and industry, which in my view is an important element to include. First, international collaboration. In today's interconnected world, the complexity of global challenges like public health and technological disruption, globally supply man global supply management, climate change, and many others require a collaborative approach that transcends national borders. However, Canada's ability to effectively engage in international research partnerships is hindered by insufficient coordination among various entities. Our research community often uh, faces barriers uh, such as limited funding mechanisms and policy coordination for international STI projects engagement. This is well reflected in the Council of Canadian Academies report published this year titled Navigating Collaborative Futures, and I quote, the need for a strategic and deliberate approach to international science, technology, innovation, knowledge partnerships is acute. Opportunities for such partnerships are rapidly expanding and Canada risks falling behind in an increasingly competitive global knowledge economy. Meanwhile, new scientific discoveries and emerging innovations are increasingly in complexity." End of quote. Second, multidisciplinary research. The second challenge we face is the need to provide more incentives for multidisciplinary research. This has been mentioned in report after report over the years. While the tri agency has moved to adjust their programs in this direction, but more needs to be done. As the research community itself is advocating for more opportunities to pursue research that cr cross tra traditional discipline lines, much of it collaborative. Third, mission driven research. Finally, the concept of uh, mission driven research has two dimensions the challenges of enhancing, not one, critical connections between research and the end users of knowledge 
and two, the alignment of our research enterprise with national and global needs and priorities. My organization, CSBC, is active in this sphere, connecting and convening researchers and end users, but more needs to be done. Canada needs a roadmap of the interrelated and interdependent economic, social, environmental, security, and technological risks that are impacting our societies, a roadmap that would frame mission-driven research initiatives, could capstone marshal the strength of our research community to anticipate and help shape the future. This mission remains critical. Again, in a rapidly changing world where research and technology are the drivers of economic, social, environmental progress, we have an enormous opportunity to up our game. In conclusion, Capstone represents a bold step toward transforming Canada's research ecosystem by enhancing international collaborations, breaking down, uh, down disciplinary silos, and driving mission-focused research. These challenges are vital if we are to remain globally competitive and address the complex. Okay, thank you. That's, that's quite a bit over. Thank you. We'll now uh, open the floor for questions, and please be sure to indicate to whom your questions are addressed. We'll start our six-minute round, please, with MP Lobb. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, my first question, I'll direct it to Sarah. In your estimation, with all the granting agencies already, why do you, why do you think we don't do everything? Like, why aren't we doing that right now? Do you I think ask doing what? Like doing well. <clears throat> I've heard, this meeting. We've heard all the great uh, possibilities of capstone and mission-driven research, et cetera. And why, with with all the wise people at all the granting agencies and at universities, why aren't we doing it already? So I think maybe it's just about the history of the creation of the tri-councils and the division of the science that then falls under the mandates of those tri-councils, because then that's how we've kind of created these silos of social sciences and humanities, natural sciences, and then the, the health research, uh, CIHR. You know, the siloing of those into those funding structures has benefited the community in the way that we can uh, consolidate different funding through those processes, but it has created gaps where you can't provide as well interdisciplinary research that might combine multiple domains. And so that's where I see the strengths of the capstone coming, is that you can have the interdisciplinarity right ingrained into the mandate, including the mission-driven. It's not to say that we don't do applied research in a lot of these, these tri-agencies, uh, but I think that dis distinction is important because applied research definitely does happen into the, the tri-agencies, but uh, the mission-driven is where you kind of have this intention from up-down, uh, where you have a vision for what that um, what the mission should be for Canada. Who do you think should be the one that decides what the missions are? Is I think that, that's, Is yeah. that the it's a really government of the day that's handing out the money? Mm -hmm. Is that the wise people at all the universities? Who do you think gets to decide the missions? Yeah, thank you so much. I, I think that's a really important question because it's important that that research and uh, broadly is occurring outside of any sort of political inference, and that is how it will be sustainable. Um, if we have something like the Science and Innovation Council that is representative of the community, I think that is where I see a large portion of vision and guidance coming from because you have that community representation. Um, I think that you will always have the operating kind of board of directors and leadership that will be more on the bureaucratic side. And I think that that will, um, the combination of the two will allow for things like that to be happening. Um, if I can, I'll say one last thing, because I think things like having publicly available strategic plans and mandates also will help that to be really accountable to the public and to policymakers to be able to hold that accountable. Allison, what, what are your thoughts on who gets to decide? Um, I, I share I share uh, the um, sentiments of my colleague in that uh, what's really essential as we look to prioritize and develop strategy and plans is that a diversity of voices. And, you know, you mentioned the universities um, several times, but we also have research taking place in clinical settings at the patient's bedsides, um, in colleges, as we heard earlier, and a variety of other settings. So I think 
um, the need to make decisions about how Canada is going to respond to these increasingly massive global challenges like climate change, AI, things like that, are increasingly um, multidisciplinary, which is perhaps to your point of why the three existing mechanisms might need um, an overarching umbrella framework for mission-driven major international um, and multidisciplinary in ways that we haven't seen so far. Great. And in all the presentations I've heard today and what I've read, very impressive. But the question maybe is, have there been enough details? Are we lacking details? Do we have any guidance on how many years, how much money? Because there's some impressive claims with this mission-driven research with Capstone. So are there details that, that you've had or that you think there should be? Uh, what, what, are the, what does it look like? Allison, you can go first, and then Sarah. We'll yeah. switch it up this time, sure. Thank you for the question. Um, I think what we're working on is the level of detail that was provided in budget 2024, and then the timeline that more will be coming out in the fall economic statement. Um, and then, of course, what we did was respond to the opportunity to provide input from our community um, earlier this summer, which, of course, was our chance to outline the principles, the risks, the ideas that we would hope would be incorporated or considered as those additional details are developed. And of course, one of our main recommendations is that all the communities continue to be consulted because clearly this is not, as I think one of the colleagues earlier said, a one and done. To get this right and to evolve it over time, you know, we all have to continue to work together and consult um, you know, throughout. I'll only echo, I'll, I'll echo mainly what Allison has said here. You know, I think we are waiting for the fall economic statement for the details that you are looking for, and I think the community is looking for as well. Um, while generally I think the community is really positive about this, there is questions, and so I think that's why it's important to have conversations like this now to say, you know, here are some of the values that we're hoping to see, um, and also then we can have conversations later about accountability and, and how to enforce things uh, once we do get some announcements. Thank you. That's the time. Thank you. We'll now turn to MP Jazik for six minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and to all the witnesses uh, for this panel. Uh, the need for a capstone organization seems to have been clearly established, starting with the Naylor Report 2017, Bouchard Report. Uh, the intention of coordination, uh, mission-driven I think we all understand that concept. I'm more interested in how the structure is actually going to work. Um, is it necessary to maintain boards of directors and CEOs for the tri-councils? Uh, why would you not, from a structural point of view, and to possibly promote efficiency uh, and maybe even save, save some money, um, have the capstone organization and just simply um, <coughs> not disband the tri-councils, tri have all that assessment of individual research projects occur via the uh, tri-councils, but somehow uh, have um, a way of coordinating that activity without having to have approvals through individual boards and CEOs that then go to the overarching capstone. So I'm just trying to understand if some of this, through the consultation that you were engaged in uh, through the summer, if some of these more detailed uh, kinds of how it will work. Uh, Ms. Evans, you use the term without delay. There seems to be a certain urgency when you talk about mission-driven, etc. How are we going to ensure that, in fact, um, there is no delay, that um, the coordination occurs rapidly? Uh, could you elaborate just in a very practical way as to how you see this working? So perhaps, Ms. Evans, I'll start with you. 
Thanks for the question. And again, um, you know, we, we share curiosity about some of the operational details and we value the opportunity we had to um, outline things we think should be being considered to operationalize well. Um, we think that all the intentions that have been shared um, and the aspirations are great, but a lot of it is the devil's in the details and implementation is, is very important. Um, we agree that um, there is a huge operational uh, streamlining and efficiencies to be gained by having all three granting agencies uh, sort of under one umbrella. And we think that there's, um, uh, you know, to your point about how this could help with speed, you know, when the pandemic hit, we didn't have a go-to spot to set up our rapid response research and this and that that was um, necessarily as transdisciplinary and robust as as we need going forwards for such things and now I think it was uh, Chad Gaffield who earlier talked about that one that one door that um, will allow the government when a major um, you know crisis or opportunity or challenge reaches a, a boiling point you know we have a, a mechanism through which the power of each three autonomous you know investigator led disciplinary rich, organizations can more more systematically work together on transdisciplinary uh, um, challenges. And, uh, Ms. Thank you. I think that it's important that the existing roles and responsibilities of the tri-agencies are relatively unimpeded during this process just because of the importance of research and the everyday research that does happen. Um, but I think that this is an opportunity to review and harmonize a lot of that interagency communication. Um, and, you know, even in the fundamental science review, they recommended that the government should undertake a comprehensive review to modernize it where possible and to harmonize a lot of those legislations between uh, the four agencies and support extramural research as well. So, you know, these have been calls that have been coming since 2017. And, um, you know, opening up the idea of capstone does allow us to reevaluate some of those things and, and even including uh, the review of current allocations of funding between the tri councils as well. Um, so I think that it, it ensures that we can have these types of conversations in a time where we are starting to have the conversation surrounding uh, preventing duplications of things and really trying to streamline and enhance productivity and, and uh, efficiency. And perhaps, uh, Dr. Hariri, uh, we, are you aware of other uh, countries' organization of this uh, sort, um, just from uh, your uh, institute's uh, knowledge of uh, potentially the structure in other countries? Could you give us some examples of where this kind of organization is working well? Sure, certainly. The, uh, one of the countries that we can uh, look into is uh, the UK and United Kingdom. And a couple of years ago, they merged a couple of uh, granting agencies into U UK Research and Innovation, what it's known as UKRI, under one CEO with one mission, but different units in it. And that perhaps could uh, provide some lessons learned, uh, which we can look into. And I hope the uh, the government and uh, the granting agencies, uh, they are looking into these models to take lessons from them. So UKRI perhaps could be one of the best examples to look at. Thank you so much. Um, in the consultations, would you say that um, there was good engagement? Were you given lots of opportunity to provide feedback through the summer? Uh, we know that that was the intention. And did you feel... Uh, you were well consulted. Uh, who? I can go first. Um, you know, it was a bit of a shorter turnaround of a consultation. Um, I think that most people were able to engage with their communities pretty rapidly, mostly because I think the research community is really interested in this. And so I think a lot of our organizations are getting constant questions about this and people want to engage. Uh, I believe that they got about 118 submissions in, I believe, about 30 days, um, which is pretty substantial and I think represents the interest from the community on this. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll now turn to MP Blanche Jonca for your six minutes, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the witnesses for a second panel. Uh, my question is to Madame Lafrançoise. I think we're turning around in circles. Today we're evaluating a framework for research funding 
which has already been proposed in 2017. Uh, we received a NILER report. Now, in 2022, we're looking for more consultation, which will come out in 23. A year later, the government wakes up and says, well, maybe we should consult uh, the public as well. Now, uh, your organization, I believe, already made some comments on the NILER report. We can talk about other framework organizations, Capstone, for example. Eight years uh, of work, a lot of time to think things over and get organized, and perhaps as a representative of that organization, uh, we know what your recommendations are, we understand what the strategies were and the consultation, so what are your expectations of the federal government to get a better representation uh, of the scientific community in order to have a finally we can get going on the project? Question. Um, I think that it has been a long time since we've first heard the calls for a unified uh, funding body. Um, like I said, there were some challenges with the current funding structures, and so um, I don't think it's, it's appropriate to think that we could change everything overnight, but I do think that it's important once we start to open up the doors to change like this, we have the ideas of proactive levels of transparency and accountability from the very beginning so that they are created in ways that are sustainable and that support this in the long term. Um, I you know, would have loved to see this announced in 2017, absolutely. I, I wouldn't say no to that. Um, but I do think that the reality is that it's being proposed right now, and I think all we can do in the moment is, is say values and, and wishes that we would like to see now, because we are having these conversations before it is announced. Résume ça quand même à huit ans de travail et bon. Eight, year, eight years of work or waiting, uh, it's, it's pretty hard. The second was saying we should take a look at this new organization for better cooperation and collaboration. The uh, uh, Bouchard report has already made some proposal, and, and uh, Minister uh, Miller also wanted to create a uh, an independent uh, arm's length organization to oversee this collaboration process. Would you agree with all those requests, or do you think there's something we forgot? If so, say so now, because we, what are your expectations of government now? d'avoir encore euh, ces valeurs de transparence et de, de comptabilité. Je, et on, a, on a eu bien du temps pour réfléchir à, aux consultations avec les diverses communautés, mais pour l'avenir, je pourrais faire des recommandations pour avoir une transparence réactive if you, <clears throat> you've heard a very important word, you, you said it, transparency. Now, the evaluation of these uh, process uh, of review, we're looking at a re uh, reform of the processes uh, so that they are more accountable, more transparent. We, we wanted to see the evaluation criteria, so that particularly on a multidisciplinary uh, review. What are your comments on that? Two forms of transparency that we like to talk about at E4D. There's reactive and proactive transparency. Proactive being the moment that we're in right now where we can create structures that will allow this to function in a transparent way. This can include you know, publicly releasing a mandate and a strategic plan. Uh, when we create councils, we can also create mandates for the council so that they are then accountable to those procedures and, and outcomes. Um, we also have things like instituting sustainable um, mechanisms and funding and training for people who are on councils like this. These will all really impact transparency in a proactive manner. Uh, reactively, I look at things like annual reports, strategic plans, who's involved in those meetings, uh, who creates the strategic plan for the capstone itself, and then um, also the, the publicly, public release of these my organization has done a variety of different research on transparency practices amongst the federal and provincial governments. And, and overall, what we're seeing is that the evidence often isn't shown in the creation of, of policies. So I think going forward, the more that we can be transparent about what those missions are and the evidence that was used to create them, the more trust that we'll generate with both the research community and the public. Merci beaucoup. Uh,
Thank you very much. Uh, in these uh, public consultations, uh, we heard from uh, large universities. Uh, very few people showed up to represent or present for uh, either uh, nonprofits and or colleges and uh, CEGEPs and polytechs. If we want to respect EDI principles, uh, well, how do we judge? You know, if they're not coming forward, now, uh, how do we how do we ensure it then? Because there is a bit of a wall of information that goes to the not-for-profit and, and third-party organizations in comparison to maybe academia or universities. I think they're already so tied into that conversation, so it's, in, it's um, quicker for them to be able to participate in a lot of these. I do think that the more publicly accessible a lot of this type of consultation happens and the more open that is, the more that the not-for-profit and, and public side will be able to contribute. Have you the impression that the government... Do you... Run out of time. <laughs> we'll turn to uh, Ms. McPherson for six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you to, to all of the witnesses for coming today and sharing their expertise with us. I've been struck by a few things that I've heard today. My, my colleague from the Conservatives, when he asked about how is the mission determined, that, that's the first thing that comes into my mind, especially when, I, when the mission-driven approach is, is described as top-down. Um, you know, I come from the international development sector, and, and certainly top-down has never been seen as something that is a, a particularly strong method. Now, on the other hand, um, Madame Lafremoise, sorry for my pronunciation, but you, you did speak about the idea that... Um, you know, we need to make sure that, that there, the representation is there, that we have a, a diversity of voices, a diversity of, of participation. But I am concerned that this process will privilege certain groups and will exclude others just by the very nature of a top-down approach. And then, Ms. Evans, when you talk about the idea of, of the, the potential in terms of the, the income and the amount of money that, that can be generated... That sometimes does, you know, we often will run into situations. I know you're from the international development sector. Vaccinating, for, for example, vaccinating kids in, in easy circumstances is, is always the, the first choice. But it's the kids that we need to vaccinate in the hard circumstances that are, that are the most important. So how will you deal with these particular challenges of making sure that the research that is being selected, or how would you propose that that would be done? Ms. Evans, I'll start with you, and then maybe I'll go to you, Ms. Lemma, for a pose. Yes, thank you so much for the question. And I think, um, you know, mission-driven, uh, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm sure we all think of it in slightly different ways. But to me, it's, it's about starting with what are we trying to solve and kind of working backwards. Um, whereas some types of basic research are more exploratory and we don't know where it's going to lead. So mission-driven, of course. But of course, that comes down to who identifies the problem and who identifies what we're trying to solve, yes. right? Yeah. Understood. And that's why, um, as I think both uh, Sarah and myself um, have talked about the importance of there being an independent mechanism outside of the capstone, um, whether that's the Council on Science and Innovation or um, a representative body, whether that's the governing council of capstone itself, but it necessarily needs to have that diversity of voices. You know, so part of what what we we heard from the health community is how important, especially if CIHR moves over from under the Minister of Health and under the Minister of Industry, we need to maintain that inextricable link. Um, the, the spirit of the act of CIHR about the health of Canadians. And um, we also need to think of people with lived experience. We need to think of people in the provinces um, at the provincial level. All of these voices are extremely important. You know, I think your uh, example about international development and what we know about the importance of local uh, voices in, in designing solutions really does um, apply here as well. So it, it comes down to how we um, set up representative bodies to, to be a part of the designation of priorities and strategies for the country. Well, yeah, and I would just, just before I, I move on, I would just say too that, that science has been historically uh, very white, uh, very colonial, <laughs> uh, very institutionally racist in a, in a number of different mechanisms. So to, to be able to, to step outside of that, I think, is very important. 
you know, I'll echo most of what Allison has said as well, because I think it's just being really intentional about that diversity and intentional about creating that landscape. And, and you mentioned who's choosing the priority areas. I think the more that we have accountability and people who are involved in those decision making processes, the more we will be able to have trust in the whole science research ecosystem and, and, and to the public as well, because I think, you know, ultimately this is taxpayer dollars. It should be accountable to the public and it should have a public interest as well. This is uh, a huge, important part of this. So I think there's a balance between that. Um, I've said it a few times in my remarks, but I think that it's worth emphasizing that this shouldn't come at the expense of fundamental research as well, because there is a balance to be struck there. Um, so much of our future in Canada depends on fundamental research. And while mission driven might be more apparent in the immediate future, um, that is how I see long term sustainable impact to our, our community and to the public. Um, I think also investing in data structures and things like this to help with that successful collaboration is an important aspect because the more that you can have successful conversations with the tri-agencies and the capstone together and the more cohesive that is, uh, the, the better that this will, will be in the long term in terms of efficiency and yeah. And then just one last question on that. Um, so, so like I mentioned to the first panel, in Alberta, the provincial government is interfering um, with funding mechanisms that are supposed to be going to the university. Um, what future proofing could be done to ensure that, that future governments uh, that, that want to choose to meddle, to interfere, are not able to do so? Because We've seen that before. We've seen the muzzling of scientists. We've seen the muzzling of research. We've, we've seen focus on research that, that has clearly had political interference. How do we, how do we protect this in, in, the, in the event of, a, of a, a different government or another government? Yeah. No, and I mean, my organization was, was founded out of a time where scientists were impeded from speaking out publicly when they worked for the federal government. And, um, you know, this has been problematic in the past. But I think that in terms of political interference, it's about creating sustainable and, and independent bodies that help guide a lot of this work. Um, the the um, Science and Innovation Council is a great potential here. And I, I emphasize this a few times today because I think that there's a lot of opportunity here to to use that. Um, in terms of the, the example in, in Alberta, I think it's also education as well as surrounding the peer review process and what that actually means. Um, I think this has been a core tenet of Canadian research and it's the backbones of what we have done. And so I really think that, you know, the more that we can talk about what that process is and, and what it, it does for Canadians uh, is important. It's over. So thank you very much. Um, so now we'll turn to our second round of questions. And we'll start that, please, with MP Kitchen for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I want to thank all the witnesses for being here. I really appreciate your comments and, and um, in some ways, enlightening on what's been going on. Um, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I've got so many questions for all of you, and I had such little time. Um, but I'll start with, with you, uh, Mr. Harari. And, and you know, I, I'm looking at your, your website, and, and it's, it's great to look at, and, um, and wh where you talk about nonprofit, nonpartisan, and non advocate organization. And, and I think that's great to see. One of the things you mentioned in your presentation was about you raise your own funds. And, and I think that's another fantastic thing, because the reality is, uh, as a, a government, we have to be very um, judicious with, with taxpayers' dollars. And, and so my question to you, I guess, initially is, could you comment in just on your thoughts as to what percentage of research do you think should be um, private investment, should be government investment, or nonprofit organizations? Uh, thank you for the question. Are you referring to the funding for research in research institutes? Is that the question? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, okay. yeah thank you. So the um, th that differs country to country, but I think the main uh, chunk of funding for research institutes coming from uh, public and from government. However, uh, the private sector also needs to step up and provide uh, the significant amount of research funding for research institutes as well as the research within the private sector because as you know there are and i, I appreciate uh, I, I guess quickly and i sorry for interrupting i'm i'm just wondering if, if you could just based on your experience percentage wise roughly and i'm not holding you to this or anything but what would you think would be a good percentage wise 
Well, currently, uh, the federal government invests around 10 to $14 billion in public research in Canada. That includes the departments as well as granting agencies. The tri agencies is around $3 billion. The business sector invests around $15 billion in research. Very small part of it comes to public research institutes. Most of the research has been conducted within the private sector firms. Thank, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, ultimately, when, when we look at that, and one of the things that we've heard around the table today is, is, is about how uh, bureaucracy consumes a lot of that funding, and it eats that up. And by creating Capstone, their concern will be how much of... Uh, how much of federal funding is actually going to go into that bureaucracy and not actually to the, as I like to say, boots on the ground, to the researchers. And, and, and that's a big concern in getting, getting that out there. And Ms. Lefranc-Rosey, I mean, you, you, your comments were, were excellent when you, when you talked about the number of, of aspects where you talked about um, reporting, uh, like feedback and public availability for plans and, and including community involvement in academia. Um, and, and in my previous life, uh, basically, I w when I did my undergraduate degree, I had to do research, and I did that. And when I did my graduate degree, I had to do a research project. And then when I did my fellowship, I had to do a research project. So I've gone through that route. The one thing it taught me is that I wasn't cut out to be a researcher, and I was going to go into clinical practice versus research practice. But the, but the reality is, as you move through those steps and, and you're presenting, making those presentations to these organizations, to the tri-committee um, tri to, to make those decisions, especially from a healthcare point of view, the reality is, to, to your point, Ms. Leffer and Rosie, where it's based on scientific merit. And that's the big challenge that we have, is the accountability on that scientific merit to determine what the research will be. So, for example, I mean, I, I'll just quote here where there was $111,000 given to um, an organization at the, or to a study at the University of British Columbia, and basically the title is Narco Animalia, Human-Animal Relations in Mexico's Narco Culture. And I guess my thought to you is, if we're talking about scientific merit, somebody gave that money to this study, where is the scientific merit? Any thoughts on that? I will say that I believe in our peer review process in Canada, and I, I believe that our tri councils uphold that in a way that funds the best research in Canada. Um, I think that we, that all research, if you know, I, and I, I'm not familiar with that study, so I can't um, elucidate on that, but. Um, you know, I, I trust that our peer review process was created in a way that is supposed to fund the best available research. But, but ultimately, that presentation, before that person would ever get, they had to come up with a, a methodology, they had to have a purpose, and they had to have a scientific basis for doing in the research they would do. And that was what the research and the funding would be based on. Not the peer review. The peer review would be based on what the report was and whether the peer review was actually as a valid study after the fact. The money was given beforehand, which is a waste of, of taxpayers' dollars, if that's the case, where it's given out before there's any actually understanding it. And Ms. Evans, any comments? Well, I, I think what I, what I think I'd like to key in on here is the opportunity that is before all of us when it comes to the three previously siloed um, granting agencies, bringing them together under a single umbrella will allow some operational day-to-day -day streamlining, some new efficiencies. It will lead to greater coherence to researchers wanting to apply to these granting agencies and allow through that umbrella mechanism, the capstone itself, to really um, make sure that we are attending to the most important priorities, the strategy we set for the country, the ways that Canada can show up to major interdisciplinary, major international and mission-driven... But, but that, driven. Um, that umbrella that you're talking about is still has the three agencies having their own a, d determination factors underneath. So now you've got two groups doing that. That umbrella isn't going to cut the the NSERC or or, or Sky Her, et cetera, because they've already given that money. And the, the setup for, for Capstone is to put another agency on top of that. And that's our time. Sorry. Thank you. 
Okay, so the next five minutes will go to MP Chen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses. Uh, the world has experienced a major global health crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so I want to take this notion of mission-driven mission, uh, research um, in, in this example. Uh, what could an organization like Capstone um, that implements mission-oriented research, uh, what would they have done differently? if we were in the midst of a global pandemic. Could you, um, Ms. Evans, talk about that further? Well, um, I guess I guess we, we're talking a little bit in theoretical here um, because um, in the absence of existing structures when the pandemic hit, you know, a whole bunch of new ways of working had to be developed all kinds of synergies across governmental departments had to be forged. Now, the urgency of the situation, I think people rose to the occasion and, um, you know, we were able to uh, set up funding for rapid response research. We were able to be at the forefront of some very important outcomes um, that not only helped in Canada, but, but elsewhere. And we've also um, seen a variety of structures and changes come into place post-pandemic based on the learnings. So how exactly... Um, the capstone where we're awaiting the details in the fall economic statement might um, purport to operationalize in those moments. You know, we're all awaiting those details. But I think that there's a sense that the time and energy invested to sort of create ad hoc cross-governmental bodies to address it was a health emergency that time. It could be a climate change emergency the next time. Maybe the forest fires were another example. Um, we just want sort of a, a one door, one stop shop going forward, where those, where those, that that interstitial tissue is already there and it's being strengthened through each successive major challenge. Countries have taken bold strategic action to enhance their research ecosystems. Uh, what can we learn from what peer countries have done so that uh, we can move forward in a way that is uh, thoughtful and, and uh, we can learn from others' uh, experiences? Um, I, I, I echo uh, my colleague uh, Merdad's earlier example of, of UK uh, RI. Um, we also have our homegrown example in the province of Quebec. Um, and I, I find that our colleagues in that province uh, have a lot of interesting perspectives and lessons learned as they um, put their own granting agencies under a single uh, umbrella. And, um, you know, I, I do think that Canada is, you know, uh, the type of country that ought to look very closely at what is working in other jurisdictions. We have our own unique challenges here, um, our, our federated model, for example. But I do think that um, we don't have to reinvent everything. And I, and I like the fact that we are making good on some of the recommendations from the previous um, studies to try and get ourselves into an operational state of readiness. Thank you. Uh, to Dr. Laframbois, in terms of uh, political interference, um, how can we make sure that in the structure or strategy around uh, the Capstone organization um, that that funding decisions uh, are independent and that we can um, prevent uh, interference, um, whether it be political, peer-to-peer, -peer, or in the um, workplace. Thank you. I think this really comes down to the accountability mechanisms that will be in place for this capstone project. Um, I see this, again, as being a really great opportunity to proactively have these conversations now. Um, I think that when we're talking about uh, political interference, we can look to examples where we know that um, when when the public kind of sees evidence and they see these types of procedures, they're more willing to trust it. And 
I, I really believe in the accountability that we have to the public on spending research dollars. And so, um, you know, uh, putting in mechanisms like publicly available reports, um, impact statements, mission statements, mandate letters, things like this, um, you'll have the opportunity to have that, that conversation surrounding accountability. But without those mechanisms, it's almost impossible to hold the, the organization accountable to its actions. And so that, that would be kind of my, my recommendations. And I have more listed uh, in my, my brief. Um, I know we don't have the details of the changes yet for for uh, this organization, uh, but if you were to talk about um, the, uh, you know, we've we've spoken about opportunities. Um, what would be one big concern you might have in terms of um, the creation of this organization? I think the involvement of the community is the most important part for me. Um, I've spent the last few years advocating for graduate students, scholarships, and and um, postdoc salaries. And I think you know it was 20 years before we saw increases to those salaries and and scholarships. Um, I hope that involving the community in the get-go and in the beginning of these types of processes will make sure that the community is heard from the very beginning. And uh, I think that that will allow for those uh, for you know 20 years to not pass before we realize that we need to improve uh, living standards standards for, for a, a group of people, but. So that's our time. So now we'll turn to MP blanchard jocard for two and a half minutes, please. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Je poursuis vers Madame la Framboise. Thank you. I'd like to continue with Madame Framboise. Uh, are you concerned that uh, those who are appointed by government to consulting bodies will be selecting people uh, in order that uh, they might be expressing uh, their vision. It's usually all the large uh, universities, nobody from smaller colleges, nobody from CIGEP, nobody from organizations, uh, E40. Uh, so what, uh, how, how can that uh, make our policies progress? I'd like to hear your answers on that. I think that in this perspective, um, really having the ability to uh, train and have um, a mandate for a, a council like the Council for Science and Innovation uh, will help to direct any of that sort of interference. Um, you know, by promoting people from the not-for-profit sector and the community, you will also diversify that in a way that should um, negate any sort of political alliances. Um, I might end there. Est-ce que vous êtes d'accord avec la recommandation du rapport Bouchard qui insiste? Would you agree with the Bouchard report there is, uh, that there should be a liaison committee between the various ecosystems, business, academia, governments, other interested stakeholders? I think that the Council for Science and Innovation is a great place for that to lay. Merci. Dans le rapport Bouchard également, on suggère... Also in the Bouchard report, uh, there should be a single window uh, to access uh, grants, uh, efficiency measure, of course, and uh, because the uh, red, the red tape and the bureaucratic load is very heavy and very costly. It's uh, undeniable. I think that um, by unifying and, and being able to review these processes in the creation of the, the capstone project, it will help to take out some of these duplications. Um, I do think that there is still a, a, a spot to play for the tri-agencies to still exist and have the independent uh, structures for funding, mostly because I think that it just allows for the peer review process to work properly because you're getting people who are uh, experienced and have uh, experience in that type of research to be able to evaluate those reports. Um, so I see, you know, it just becomes who should you be applying for, and it's the education side of, of where you should be directing that. Merci. Thank you, Thank you very much. So Thank you. Ms. MP Idelote, to our committee, in keeping with the theme that it takes a village to replace Mr. Canning, she was the third person today, and we also had one briefly on the screen. So anyway, for two and a half minutes, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the witnesses. Uh, I did listen to a bit of uh, the testimony. Uh, one of the questions that came to mind in, based on some of your responses so far, uh, we know that, for example, uh, Canada just didn't emerge, that uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit were here before Canada became a country. 
uh, and through uh, colonial and genocidal policies, uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit uh, were actively suppressed. Uh, their knowledge, their expertise, their science was ignored. Uh, and I think we still see the impacts of that. We still don't see enough uh, indigenous um, researchers, scholars um, at, in academia. We do have some. I'm, I'm very lucky to have a good friend of mine who is also an M MP who says she is uh, recovering from academia. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I'm curious uh, in this process with the with the creation of this uh, capstone, which the NDP support, what will you? What will this agency do to ensure that uh, indigenous research is also supported, that indigenous expertise is part of the design, and that indigenous researchers are also funded through through the capstone? Um. I really appreciate the question, and it's very important. And again, not to speculate on how exactly um, that might be uh, addressed in the future organization. What I was uh, think uh, we were all pleased to see that in the What We Heard report and across so many of those more than 100 submissions that went into this process, those very uh, considerations and concerns were, were there and acknowledged. And I think that whether it's um, indigenous Métis Inuit uh, knowledge, uh, ways of doing research, uh, representation, whether it is patients with lived experience, whether it is citizens, whether um, it's the not-for-profits or the colleges or any groups that have been uh, underrepresented, you know, we've seen over the years many... Um, activities, many um, initiatives designed to further our progress in these areas. But of course, this is an inflection point where we can make a commitment to doing even better. So with change comes the opportunity to do better. Thank you so much. And that's our time. And thank you to our witnesses, uh, both on the screen and here in person today. We really appreciate your testimony. If you have anything further to add, you may submit it to the, the clerk. And um, I just want to remind our members that our next meeting on Thursday will be reviewing the second draft of the U15 report, and we will have committee business. We need to focus on what we're going to do after the capstone study in, uh, in that. So hopefully we'll be able to have a discussion of that. And uh, is it the will of the committee to adjourn? Okay. Thank you very much.